All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed um, those instructional videos. Uh, my name is Christina Cafesty, and I am chief of the policy and program analysis branch at NHGRI. And I'm pleased to bring this amazing symposium to a close with today's Louise M. Slaughter National DNA Day Lecture. This lecture is named after Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, who in 2003 led a group of legislators to pass a concurrent resolution creating National DNA Day to celebrate the completion of the Human Genome Project and the 50th anniversary of the discovery of DNA's double helix structure. Representative Slaughter passed away in 2018 after a barrier-breaking career dedicated to science and public service. She was one of the earliest champions of genomics on Capitol Hill and a steadfast advocate for policies that allowed genomics research to advance to the point it is today. It is also thanks to her that we now have a law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, that prohibits genetic discrimination and whose protections allow patients and research participants to undergo genetic testing without fear that their results will be used to negatively impact their job or access to health insurance. To bring us full circle on this DNA day, our next speaker worked closely with Mrs. Slaughter on Gina for years, literally years. Until recently, he was the director of the National Institutes of Health and previously directed the National Human Genome Research Institute. It is my privilege to introduce a man who needs no introduction if there is any DNA in the room, Dr. Francis Collins. <laughs> okay. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, want to have the opportunity in this last hour, or maybe a little less than that, of today's remarkable symposium uh, to talk a bit about my own sort of view of the long sweep of why we're here and what exactly has transpired over these 70 years. First of all, I want to say thanks to all those who worked really hard to put this together. This was a big event, uh, all of the uh, many people who had to assemble the various components uh, to make this happen um, because Eric Green told them to. And uh, when Eric says do something, you're doing By the way, I'm, I'm planning to be gracious about having won the competition, so I'm not going to rub his nose in it. Was a, it was a good, reasonable competition, even though some of the things in that video I think were rigged. Ask Eric to play the piano sometime and see what happens. <laughs> Just say it. <clears throat> but no, there was a huge amount of effort that went into this. Uh, people like Sarah Bates and many others who put uh, heart and soul into making this the most amazing America, uh, day of uh, April 25th that we've had in a very long time. So let me kind of uh, give you a bit of a perspective about the last 70 years. I do want to give a shout out, uh, as was already done, uh, to Louise Slaughter because of the fact that she made major contributions to the fact that DNA can now be utilized for your own health without fears of having it used against you. And I'll come to a bit more about that. Uh, she was a colleague and a good friend. And I'm sorry we lost her five years ago, but she played a huge role in a major component of what the Genome Project was able to do in the public policy arena. So this is what DNA means to you. Have a look at that picture for a moment. <laughs> this is how it works. Mom and dad get together and they have a baby and baby gets half of mom and half of dad. That was uh, what seemed to happen on this boardwalk anyway. Well, let's get a little bit more into the molecular biology than that. It is, of course, that double helix. And it is, of course, the 70th anniversary of April 25th, 1953. So let's take it a little trip on our time machine. Imagine that you are somebody walking around right then. What would you be using for social media? Well, kind of stuff like this, uh, radio, maybe a little bit of a TV that's about the size of your phone. TV Guide had just been introduced. It was a really big deal. I'm sure you're using that a lot these days. Uh, that's what people were paying attention to. And unknown to them, uh, somewhere in the United Kingdom, 
an insight had happened. And it was April 25th in the journal Nature, where that insight was published, uh, including that diagram you see there of the double helix, which, by the way, that is a right-handed helix. I hope none of you will ever make the mistake when you're drawing DNA to accidentally make a left-handed helix, because if you do, you'll end up on the wall of shame on the internet. And there's an awful lot of people on the wall of shame who maybe should have known. By the way, my, my tie, one third of it is on the wall of shame. <coughs> and you will see there are, there are three uh, different renditions of DNA here. That one is right-handed. That one is right-handed, but this guy in the middle is left-handed. I had to tell you so you wouldn't come up later and say, did you know? <laughs> it's still a really nice tie, and since people were showing off their scarves and their socks this morning, <clears throat> I had to point this out. So it was April 25th, 1953, when this double helical structure was published. You can see the photograph of Watson and Crick uh, pointing to the model that they had built, uh, showing how those bases paired with each other. Uh, spinning, spinning around this uh, central axis in this beautiful, remarkable, most amazing molecule ever, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. But there's another part of this story that we should not just gloss over, and that is their ability to put together this structure depended upon seeing some experimental data. And it was not data that they had generated. It was that data generated by this person, Rosalind Franklin, and it was that particular picture you see there, plate 51, uh, which in her efforts to try to do X-ray crystallography of DNA, she had obtained this. And it was that particular pattern, uh, which seen uh, by Watson, was recognized as pointing to this being a double helix and led to their changing their plan about how to put together the models and coming up with what we now know is the right answer. So whenever we talk about DNA and we talk about Watson and Crick, and we do, we should also talk about Rosalind Franklin. She did the work. Sadly, uh, she lost her life to ovarian cancer, maybe because of the radiation she was exposed to as part of her job, before the Nobel Prize was awarded for the double helix uh, to Watson and Crick and, and uh, one other fellow uh, in 1962. But let's uh, always, and whenever we talk about DNA, think about Rosalind. Well, I didn't know that was going on. I was actually three years old uh, when that uh, announcement was made, and nobody told me. And this is me about mm, age seven or eight, I guess. This is where I grew up, on a farm about two and a half hours from here in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, did not have indoor plumbing, just in case you're wondering. Uh, this was a fairly austere kind of way uh, to have your first uh, 10 or 12 years. But it was also wonderful, because my parents were really into the arts and theater and founded a theater in the Oak Grove up above our farmhouse that is still, I think this year is its 70th consecutive season. So I was surrounded by lots of, of exciting people in arts and music and theater, not at all in science. That came along later in a wonderful high school, by, uh, high school chemistry class uh, taught by a very gifted uh, teacher who made me realize that science is really cool because it's, in it, it's basically a detective work. You're trying to figure out answers using clues, and some of them are wrong, and some of them are right, and eventually you figured out what happened. So that was um, 1953. It's not the only thing that happened in 1953. We have some other anniversaries to celebrate, so let's give them credit to the Corvette. TV Guide, I mentioned already, uh, means a lot now. Cheese Whiz. Probably not a terribly popular product, but it's still there. And Marshmallow Peeps, you know, when you have those that you put in your shelf and let them dry out, uh, well, they got started in 1953 also. It was the first to send them out ever. So, okay, that's pretty significant. But I still think, look at that list. What really <laughs> happened that mattered here? It's that last one. So that was 1953, and now here we are in 2023 with a whole lot of amazing things that have happened about that double helix since. So what happened in between? We learned a lot about how this molecule does what it does, although we are still learning. This is still my favorite picture, although it's old, because it really shows you the way in which DNA is kind of wrapped up inside the nucleus and then rolled out there to show the base pairing, A match with T and G with C. And all living organisms use this same way of coding information and passing it from generation to generation. It's in the visual arts, like in my tie. Lots of things here that you see DNA around you no matter where you go. 
Uh, my 18-year-old uh, grandson will be getting his DNA tattoo on his torso in about a month, and it better be a right-handed <laughs> helix. <laughs> but let's look at the timeline here. Uh, it's a wonderful diagram that was made uh, by, uh, I think, by Daryl Legia a long time ago that basically shows you some of the main things that happened going back to Mendel. And of course, uh, Watson and Crick came along as part of that. It was only 1944 where people had evidence that DNA was the hereditary material. So that's where they fell in there. But then, of course, how does that work? How does this instruction book actually turn into some action? Right here in this very space, <laughs> You should look, as you go out, if you haven't looked at it already, at the display on Marshall Nirenberg, which is out here, because Nirenberg, here at NIH, figured out how DNA goes to RNA and how then RNA goes to protein, that genetic code. Recombinant DNA came along, the Belmont report about human subjects, and then a whole lot of other things over the course of the next few years. And I think it would be fair to say, if you were a scientist, as I was in the 1980s, interested in trying to track down the causes of a human genetic disease, you're going to have a really hard time. There was no genome to work with. You could get little bits and pieces of it. If you worked really hard, you could read out maybe 100 letters uh, of a DNA code in an afternoon. That was kind of it. And if you wanted to actually find a disease gene, which you didn't know where it was, somewhere in that three billion base pair genome, you had no signpost really to guide you and you didn't have much in the way of computational assistance and it was hard. So for instance, a search for something like cystic fibrosis, which really got started in a pretty significant way in 1982, uh, took seven years uh, before it finally found the answer. And as I was part of that, I had to explain why it was so hard. And so I had to have a picture of myself taken in a Michigan haystack holding up a needle saying, this is why it's so hard. We're trying to find a needle in the haystack. The needle, in the case of cystic fibrosis, just three letters, a CTT, that was missing from an exon of a gene that nobody had ever really paid attention to before. And that was an answer that then found its way into a publication. But it was so hard to do that. You could imagine. Uh, how difficult it would be to do that for thousands of diseases. So we had to have a better plan. And meanwhile, that plan was being very much thought about and put together. And this was a particularly important document from the National Academy of Sciences with a very distinguished group of senior scientists, some of whom had been pretty opposed to the idea of doing the Human Genome Project, but came around in the course of these debates and very reasonably put out a plan, which was not that you just start sequencing human DNA on day one but you're going to have to get the technology a whole lot better because it's not up to the task. And you should start with other genomes that aren't quite so big, but which are also going to be really interesting in order to build up your capability. So start with bacteria and, and yeast. And let's do that roundworm, which is so important. And all of that built the interest of a lot of people to come alongside and join this effort. And it was almost exactly 30 years ago that I left my position at the University of Michigan with my heart in my throat to come and be a federal employee and to manage the, the NIH part of the Human Genome Project, which ultimately became the lead in this effort. And an amazing ride it was, indeed. The first few years, we worked on those model organisms. We worked on building maps, both physical maps and genetic maps uh, of the human genome. I want to highlight, though, some really important things that happened that weren't just about sequencing or technology, and that was about the principles we were going to follow. And particularly down there in the lower right corner, in 1996, we had to make a decision about exactly what to do with the data that was being generated. Because we knew this project, which wasn't supposed to be done until 2005, wasn't going to have a big publication to describe the nature of the data that was being generated. And yet people were interested in the data as it was coming out, even though it was fragmentary and it hadn't been assembled. If you were working on a particular gene and the Genome Project had just produced some sequence data, you wanted to see it. And so a group got together, and it sounds very lovely in, in Bermuda. I don't remember anything except the conference room. And we really had it out here about what is going to be the data access and release policy. And to the credit, I think, of the group that you see there, a remarkably hard-driving set of scientists who are all pretty competitive with each other, they decided, no, this time the right thing to do is to just make all this information available. 
that you see there, the whiteboard, that's the handwriting of the late John Sulston, who got up at the board to sort of put down the comments of what the decision would be. And you will see automatic release of sequence assemblies greater than one kilobase, preferably daily. And then immediate submission of finished annotated sequence. And that's what we all committed to. Uh, the representatives there from six countries, some of whom realized they had no authority to make that commitment, but they did it anyway. And that has become really the norm uh, for genome science. That if you're going to do a large, complicated, community a beneficial project, then the community needs to benefit by having access to the data. That it was pretty transformative. That had really not been done until this decision was made. So it's worth highlighting a bit. Things got a little complicated after that. There was a private sector enterprise that said, hey, we'll take it from here. The government effort doesn't need to continue, or maybe they should just sequence the mouse because we'll take care of the human. There were, suddenly, the people got interested about the Genome Project because now, you know, it was contentious and there was a, a battle going on and who has a yacht and who has a motorcycle suddenly became important. And it was a little unseemly, actually, from time to time. And fortunately, it was possible, and there's a whole story about how that came to be, uh, to basically declare a truce and to say, let's celebrate that we are actually, by June of 2000, in the position of saying we have a pretty good draft of the human genome. And that is what happened June the 26th in the East Room of the White House, where President Clinton, pointing out that that was the very room where Lewis and Clark had unfolded their map uh, of the western part of the United States, we're unfolding another map, he said, the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. Uh, it seemed pretty uh, over the top at the time, but you know, looking back, I'm not sure uh, that that's over the top at all. This is an amazing map, not just about something else, but about us. At the same time, there was no publication. <laughs> John Sulston said, you know, we're all just a bunch of phonies being here making an announcement about this because we haven't really hit any particularly measurable milestone. We're probably about 90% coverage in this draft, which is not very fully assembled yet. And we just decided to say, we did it. <laughs> but it was important to say because it really did turn a corner. But we couldn't stop there. We had to have some deep analysis of what this all meant and the next Several months uh, were deeply engaged in that. And that then led to, in 2001, the publication in Science and in Nature, back to back, of versions of the human genome. You saw Joni Rutter waving her own copies around this morning. And I have uh, copies of this also that I keep rather carefully. If you go, actually, oddly enough, um, my copy of Nature uh, that has that is currently in an exhibit in the Museum of the Bible downtown, if you're interested in seeing where that is. So that nature issue, by the way, we worked hard on the uh, artistry there of what should that look like. It's got to be the double helix, but how do you make that pattern? And yes, it's a mosaic of people's images, and we had a little fun burying a few secrets in there. If you look very carefully, uh, Watson and Crick are down there in that part, and Rosalind Franklin, unfortunately, at that point was not, and I will always regret that. So what did we do? We had a party. We published the first draft, and we had the analysis of it. There were a lot of surprises, and we got to have a celebration. And where is this? Uh, this is the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C., which is a pretty elegant space, much more elegant than most scientists have generally been invited uh, to run the show for. And we had a band, uh, yes, of course, there's always got to be music. Uh, so we were, uh, in that case, uh, putting forward some songs written for the occasion. And people were having a pretty darn good time. We worked really hard to get to this point. My mother came, that's her in the red. And you can see uh, there's Eric looking a little younger and me looking well, quite a bit younger and Barb Biesecker over there. And I'm not sure who is uh, pointing at me. It might be Gabby, it's, I thought it's, it's Eric's wife. And yeah, we are right now dredging up more of these photos and it is kind of fun to look back on those. So this is 2001. But that was still not the completion of the Human Genome Project. We had to finish, as best we could in those days, all of those chromosomes that still had gaps. And that was another very tough set of a couple of years of hard work. And it's like every other project, you know, the last 5% takes you half the time. And there was a lot of that, but people stuck to it. And you couldn't have any chromosomes that were like 
sorry, not quite as good over here. Everything had to get done, so the genome centers had to agree to kind of share the effort. Meanwhile, people were having fun about how hard this was. I don't know why the onion <laughs> decided that this was a story. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the onion picks this picture of Bob Waterston, who is running the Genome Center at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, gives him somebody else's name, Farian, and then re <laughs> recaptions his poster a little bit to just say, what the hell, when he's actually <laughs> showing a diagram of a chromosome. Yeah, th th this is like, okay. And, and read the story here. The National Sound Science Foundation has had their big symposium. They have reached the consensus that Science is hard. <laughs> well, we kind of knew that already. Anyway, I still would love to know who came up with that. So yes, we had to finish the job, the finished version of the human genome sequence uh, with all of the closures that we could do at that point. Um, obviously, Adam Philippi has come along and finished really, and I'll mention that in a minute, uh, the genome. But at the time we had that, the technology we had, that was it. So we had another party. Uh, this is the Library of Congress. I can't find any pictures of that. If anybody has some, I'd love to have them. And yeah, we had a logo, ACTG, isn't that clever? A celebration of the genome. And um, that was exactly 20 years ago, hence the reason for calling this the 20th anniversary of the Human Genome Project's completion. So all of these folks had labored uh, without ceasing. Uh, many of them for the entire course from 1990 until 2003. An amazing group of dedicated scientists. None of them worried too much about who was going to get the credit, just rolling up their sleeves, coming up with all kinds of creative solutions to the problems that we faced. Six countries, this group, even though it's a large group, represents 2,400 scientists who work together to make this happen. And I will always be grateful uh, to them and for the opportunity uh, to have served in this role as the International Sequencing Project Director. But okay, that's fine. What do we do with this information now? Well, we had to think about what's the next step here. And one of my jobs at that point, because I was leading the Genome Institute, was to try to come up with some kind of iconic way of describing where we needed to go next. And I was in a bookstore looking at um, books about architecture, and I had recently visited Falling Waters, Frank Lloyd Wright's a masterpiece, which is not far from here in Pennsylvania. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll come to that in a minute. We have 20th anniversaries also in 2023, The Bachelorette. <laughs> Still going. SARS, wasn't that a good one? Not SARS-CoV-2, but SARS, the original SARS. That was 2023. Freedom fries, remember that? Because uh, people in Congress were mad at the French because they wouldn't join our invasion of Iraq. Um, Finding Nemo is 20 years old. Can you believe that? The Department of Homeland Security. I'm sure they're having a celebration today, too. And yes, completion of the Human Genome Project. Once again, I would say, you know, go down the list. Uh, what's the one that will be commented about in 100 years? I'm guessing it's that last one. So back to the diagram. So yes. This was an effort to try to depict in a visual icon what happens now. Human Genome Project down there is like the foundation. Um, and the, here's this building, and by the way, the door is open, inviting everybody to come in and work with us. And in this simplistic view, and there's a much more elegant view, if you didn't pick up one of these, by the way, on the table out there, you should, because it gives a much more nuanced perspective these days of where genomics is going. But a simple definition here might have divided this up into biology, sort of the science of understanding the genome. How does it apply to health? And then how does it apply to society? The Genome Project from the beginning had been unique in thinking about those ethical, legal, and social issues, the so-called LC program. And more than ever, now that the genome really was in hand, you needed to think about what measures need to be taken to maximize the benefit and minimize the harms. You'll see the vertical pillars that hold this all together. And looking back on this, I think we were actually looking ahead pretty effectively for 2003. Resources, yeah, technology, oh my gosh, computational biology, training, LC, education, all of that, holding the building so that these three floors uh, can all flourish and flourish interactively. So how did we do? Let's talk about the LC part. 
the big concern at that point really was, now that we have the opportunity to give everybody their own DNA information, which you might want to have, and we've talked about that a lot today, will it get used against you? Will it be a reason for your health insurance to be canceled? Will it be a reason for your employer to say, hmm, maybe not such a good person to invest in for a promotion, uh, might get sick later, um, think I'll pass this person over. Those were very real issues. They were happening to real people. I think anybody who thought deeply about it would say, you didn't get to choose your DNA, it should not be used against you. But there was, at the time of 2003, nothing to stop that. Now that effort to try to come up with a solution, a legislative solution against genetic discrimination, actually got started back in 1996 as part of the LC program. And there were papers published <coughs> from workshops that basically laid out how to do this and what it would take. But it wasn't really catching much momentum. A person who wrapped her arms around this very early on was Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, for whom this lecture is named. And I got to know a Congresswoman Slaughter almost immediately and had innumerable opportunities to talk about where is the window that might open up uh, to get something like this moving forward in the Congress. You can imagine who was against it. Uh, the health insurance companies are like, well, don't worry. Well, we won't ever do much like that. They don't want to have their hands tied. And of course, the employers, they don't want to have their hands tied either. And so there was substantial pressure and it took year after year, and you would think, oh, we're getting close. Uh, here's where I thought we were getting close. This is 2007 in a picture, and that is Louise Slaughter uh, in the picture with a bunch of staff uh, from NHGRI uh, and others from uh, uh, director's office. And she, her inscription there is, thanks for this best of DNA days, uh, Louise Slaughter, uh, April 25th, 2007. So you might have thought, OK, they passed it. Well, no, they didn't quite. <laughs> that was another sort of disappointing year. But it finally got better. And so this is 2008. This is a moment I will not forget. This is the moment where the House of Representatives, moments earlier, have passed the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act with good confidence that the Senate would do the same with the same version. Senator Ted Kennedy, who'd worked really hard on this on the Senate side, walked across to Congress, which senators don't usually do, and came and sat with us in this little room off the gallery uh, of the House of Representatives, which used to be used for reporters to call in the latest of what's happening. That's those funny phone booths uh, behind the members here. And so, yes, uh, you'll see, uh, starting on the right, Anna Eshoo, uh, Judy Biggert, who was the lead in the Republicans for this, um, I mentioned Ted Kennedy, uh, Louise Slaughter, who had been so faithful to this, and I would say the main credit for actually getting this done had to go to her. And then Congressman Andrews from New Jersey, who'd also pitched in to get this across the finish line. And not long after that, we're in the Oval Office, and President George W. Bush, May 21st, 2008, is signing uh, the bill in front of a small group of us. And I will say, after he signed it, I asked him if I could have the pen. Because <laughs> sometimes they do that. And I was like, no, that's going to my library. <laughs> so I assume if you go to the Bush Library, you will see the pen that was used to sign this most significant piece of legislation about genetic discrimination ever. Uh, but I don't have it. But he graciously then sent me afterwards a copy of the bill uh, with an inscription uh, there, if you can read his handwriting, which is a little challenging. This was a really big deal. This is not to say that we fully addressed all of the issues with genetic discrimination because they are still out there. And there are even threats uh, to this particular law uh, by employers. Um, and certainly, if you're contemplating getting DNA information about yourself, you should recognize that you're not protected against discrimination in other areas of insurance, like life insurance, like long-term disability. And you can kind of see why that might be because of what would be called adverse selection. If you know that you're at very high risk of Alzheimer's disease and you're fine right now and you want to buy a policy that's uh, a very expensive one without revealing that that risk, uh, eventually that is going to destabilize the way in which insurance works. I kind of get that, but I still don't like it. 
And so states like Vermont that have decided we're just going to protect people against that kind of discrimination anyway, my hat is off to them. But it's not safe in other places. So you should think about that <clears throat> before you decide to have a genetic test. So that was a big deal. Now there's a lot of things happening in the ethical, legal, and social issues. And you already heard about one of them in a very wonderful panel this morning that Vince Bonham uh, led, which is this report, which just came out. And again, it's very well written. It's worth diving into. And for genetics researchers, uh, this is a really helpful way to guide us in terms of how exactly we use population descriptors in genetics and genomics research. Recognizing that race and ethnicity are freighted with all kinds of misunderstandings and lots of things go into those that have nothing to do with genetics. In fact, most of what goes into them has little to do with genetics and yet they are still used awkwardly and sometimes misleadingly in science research in a way that has not really benefited anybody. Uh, so this document, I think, is a very good way uh, to point out a better direction. And I like the quote which Vince sent me as sort of a, a good example of the way in which this report comes forward. Although imperfect, categories and labels are needed. It's not like saying, well, we're not going to say there's any differences between us, because there are between our ancestry and our environmental exposure and our culture and our social experiences. We need those in some way, but transparency requires stating the rationale behind the classification scheme you are using and what group labels you're applying so that it is not immediately misunderstood. And I think that's a very important set of, of exhortations uh, to all people who are doing genetics research. Meanwhile, of course, we had to figure out how to take this three billion letters of the human genome and turn it into something that would help uh, the medical situation uh, this cartoon of two physicians just looking at A, C's, G's, and T's and trying to help the guy in the hospital bed, uh, that's not the answer we want. You want to have information about how this works. And an awful lot of what's been going on in the course of the last 20 years that relates to genomics has at least an indirect implication and sometimes a very direct implication to trying to answer those questions. And for me as a physician, this has been a driving force of trying to be sure we're doing everything we can to accelerate that process of developing genomic medicine, you might call it precision medicine. So an awful lot of things got done by the Genome Institute, working oftentimes with other partners. Lots of these projects following the same kind of ethics as the Genome Project of let's bring a lot of people together, let's get them to work on a really hard problem and then give all the data away. And that's what happened in many of these and it's continuing to this day. This is an incomplete list, to be sure. But maybe it would be appropriate uh, to highlight a couple of the things that have happened. There's our nature cover. And here's what basically Adam Philippi and his colleagues, um, particularly Karen Miga, were able to do with the new technology that you may have seen him talking about in that video, which allows you to do very long reads and therefore to get through uh, these regions of chromosomes, the centromeres, the telomeres, uh, heterochromatin regions that are very highly repetitive. And imagine if you're trying to reassemble those uh, for, and the stretch you're trying to reassemble runs over tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of base pairs and you have pieces that are only a few hundred base pairs, you just can't figure out how to put them together if they're all kind of the same. But with a long read, you can do that. And so the so-called T to T, telomere to telomere project has finally, I guess, put an end to our celebrations of completing the human genome. We've had a lot, darn it. Adam, you've ruined it for us from now on. We have to admit it's actually done. Uh, but bravo for that. And that technology is also going to be really helpful in lots of human uh, genetics applications. Other things that are happening in the technology arena that deserve notice. I just can't say enough about how dramatic it is that we can now do genomics on single cells. I mean, think about it. What do you think of the three most significant insights in biology in all of human history? Hmm. Well, one would be evolution. One would be DNA as the hereditary material. And I think the third one would be cells, that cells are the unit of all living things. And if you want to understand life, you need to understand cells. And yet, we have not, until very recently, been able to ask just one cell, hey, what are you doing? And we can do that now. We can ask that cell, what genes have you turned on and which ones are turned off? 
and even how much have you turned them on? And we can ask that cell, what's the state of your chromatin? Which parts of your chromatin are sort of open for access uh, to transcription factors and which parts are closed? Single cell biology, single cell RNA-seq and single cell ATAC-seq are approaches that people are taking. And while we could, I guess you could say we were studying single cells if you were doing it in a laboratory, growing cells in a culture dish and they were all identical, well, okay, then you could study a few million of them and you'd kind of know what happened to that original cell that gave rise to that. But that's not the way human biology needs to be studied now. You want to look in that person. You want to know exactly all those cells in the pancreas. That's what my lab works on. All those cells in the brain. There's a huge effort there. What are each of them doing? And the complexity you uncover is breathtaking. Because if you don't have the ability to look cell by cell and you just have to mush everything together, and see what the average kind of cell is doing, you're missing most of the exciting stuff. Single cell biology, for people who are interested in this field and think maybe all the excitement has already happened, uh-uh, <laughs> this is like going to be transformative. And particularly so for the brain. Oops, I went backward or something. Oh, I am suddenly, that was weird. Okay, we're in the forward motion again. A huge application that has made a big difference in understanding the most common diseases, things like diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's, is this ability to scan across the genome, uh, studying lots of people, and find those places where there are small differences that have an effect on individual risk. And this is the genome-wide association study, or GWAS approach. You need DNA from controls and cases that are well characterized. And you need to be able to genotype all those people. And then you scan across the whole genome. And you say, is there a place where the people who are affected have a higher likelihood of this particular spelling, of this particular variant? And there's statistics to tell you whether that's actually real or whether it's just noise. And that has been transformative. My lab that works on diabetes, we're now over 600 places in the genome where there are absolutely convincing variants that play a role in this very common disease of diabetes. And it's hard to sort all those out and figure out what they're telling us about the networks and the pathways that are involved. But that is the best insight we're going to have for a while in terms of the ways in which these common diseases come about and why they run in families but not in easily understood ways. One of the things that will help us with that, which I need to give a little shout out to and which Josh Denny uh, was here this morning, is now the leader of, is this project called All of Us, which aims to try to figure out how do those genetic variations that we all have, our environmental exposures, our health behaviors, our medical experiences, how can we make sense out of that uh, to really do a better job of what you'd call precision health? Not one size fits all, but precision health. Uh, in case you're not part of this and you're 18 or over, joinallofus.org is up there and you can find out how to get on board. Because we're aiming for a million, and as you can see, we're a little over 600,000. So there is still time, but there won't be time forever. All of these folks actually make their electronic health records available. They fill out all kinds of questionnaires. I'm part of this, so I'm always getting hit with a new questionnaire, but I always answer. And it becomes this incredible, valuable database that anybody who's willing to assert that they're not going to try to identify individuals and a few other things have access to the data. It was just a few days ago that they released 245,000 whole genome sequences on all of us participants. That, at least for the moment, I think it's the largest collection of whole genome sequences of any project. And that is going to be just amazing, and researchers are already plunging in uh, to see what they can learn there. Cancer, of course, has been just a profoundly important part of what genomics has done uh, in terms of medical issues, in terms of things that are happening right now in the clinic. I ran up uh, in the middle of today to see a patient uh, upstairs who is in the process of a human clinical trial for cancer, and it's because of genomics uh, that this patient is receiving a very precisely focused approach uh, to his cancer based upon a precise knowledge of what exactly is driving the cancer for him, which genes are misspelled, not on average, but in his tumor, and how can you match that up with the available therapeutics, be they 
chemotherapy drugs that are designed to be very targeted, or be it immunotherapy. And cancer is uh, so different now than it was 20 years ago because of all of this. And for rare diseases, that story I told you about how painful it was to try to find the cystic fibrosis gene, and this is totally changed because of the availability of the genome sequence and the technologies that allow you to track down those causes. Uh, back there when the Genome Project started in 1990, you can see there were 68 rare disorders where we knew the molecular basis. The number now, 6,800. And that has increased drastically, especially since the Genome Project was completed. And the, what we did for cystic fibrosis, which I think uh, took us seven years, and that was more than one group uh, working sometimes together, sometimes not, and all kinds of people who got burned out along the way, seven years. I would think a pretty good graduate student with access to family DNA samples, um, a PCR cycler, and a DNA sequencer could probably have done that in one week. Because that's the way it is now with the ability to speed everything up with the technology that's changed. So that means these 6,800 conditions can now be effectively and accurately diagnosed by simply going and looking to see what is that DNA misspelling. But of course, you don't want to stop there. You want to have something to offer people who have those conditions, many of which are very rare. And I'm sad to say that even now, the number of these that have an approved therapy is only about 500. So we have a huge need here, a yawning gap between our diagnostic ability and our therapeutic ability. But there is a lot of hope uh, to see that beginning to close, although much of it still lies ahead. Gene-based therapies are expanding a lot of those options. I should say for cystic fibrosis, that is one of the ones that has an approved therapy which works remarkably well. But it took 30 years to get there. And it's a drug therapy which would be really hard to do for each one of those thousands of diseases without hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on each one. So the ideal solution would be if you have something you could scale, that you have an apparatus, let's call it maybe gene editing, where you could go and fix that misspelling with an appropriate targeted way of getting there. You need a delivery system. All those pieces are starting to look like they're coming together, although only in a very few places have we actually seen that succeed. But there are some dramatic examples. Spinal muscular atrophy would certainly be one. And there's an awful lot of activity in this space, as you can see in the diagram there. And this needs to be updated from 2019 because it was headed straight up. It got slowed down a little bit with COVID, but it is actually going up pretty steeply again. One of the ones that I think has attracted an awful lot of attention, and rightly so, is the first molecular disease, sickle cell disease, which we knew in 1949 was autosomal recessive. We knew in 1957 that there was a misspelling of a hemoglobin protein which must therefore be due to a misspelling in the DNA. And yet, until very recently, what we could do for sickle cell disease was not particularly impressive in terms of doing something to avoid the terrible, painful crises that people with this condition go through. But all that is changing, although it's still at the point now of being a research enterprise. And I have to throw in this picture in this clip because this is work done here in this building uh, by John Tisdale and his group on gene therapy for sickle cell, which got a lot of attention in 60 minutes, and well, it should have, because it's working. And the diagram down in the right there, uh, the people before enrollment, every one of those orange dots is a sickle cell crisis. After the infusion of, in this case, uh, a lentiglobin uh, therapy, which is a viral way of delivering ex vivo to bone marrow, the gene that's going to be necessary uh, to overwhelm the sickle mutation, you can see, I think there's one dot, and otherwise, everybody is pretty much free of these kinds of terrible crises. And I think it was yesterday uh, that Bluebird, who is the collaborator uh, with Dr. Tisdale, submitted to FDA their materials to ask for approval. And another company that uses CRISPR has already done so. So it's fairly likely, if FDA loves the data they see, that this will become an approved therapy for sickle cell disease. And that's good, but it also is challenging because the current cost of that <clears throat> is way out there. In order to do this, you have to mobilize the bone marrow from the person that you're going to try to treat, take it out of the body so that you can do this genetic manipulation. 
but you also have to put that person in the hospital and give them basically a bone marrow ablation to wipe out their current bone marrow to make space for the cells that you've corrected. Otherwise, nothing happens. So for a month or so, they're in a very vulnerable place. And that is the sort of thing that really costs a lot of money with all the care and people sometimes get infected and you can see from the picture here. And this is not the kind of thing you could do in an outpatient clinic. And you certainly couldn't do it in most parts of the world where sickle is most common. Where is that? We use these maps that take the world and distort them by a particular thing you're asking about. In this case, the frequency of newborns that have sickle cell anemia. And the US there doesn't look very impressive on this scale, although we have 100,000 people alive with sickle cell right now. But look at Africa and look at India. Uh, that's where most of the needs are going to be. And that's not where this ex vivo approach with all the uh, extremely high needs uh, for medical care are going to be easily done. So we have to figure out how to do this in a different way. Here's the challenge. You need to have a gene therapy that you can deliver in a single dose, probably intravenously, with a vector, maybe it's a nanoparticle, maybe it's a virus, that is engineered so that it homes to where it needs to go in the bone marrow to those cells that give rise to red cells, those erythropoietic uh, stem cells. That actually has almost been done in a mouse model by a couple of groups. It's not crazy to imagine that. And if we could actually do that in a scaled up way, then maybe where the real needs are would have a chance of being addressed. If you could do this in a low resource setting with a single visit, that would be an achievement. That's the kind of thing to dream about. That leads me to the final thing that I want to say about where we as people who care a lot about genomics might need to be thinking even more, and that's about the rest of the world. We're incredibly fortunate in this country to have the resources to make it possible to do this kind of research and then to see those applications begin to happen. But most of the rest of the world is not like that. We're all part of one family. Genomics taught us that. My DNA is 99.9% .9 identical to somebody else regardless of who I pick. And I think that means that for us as people who care about science and medicine, the people we care about have to be all of the people and not just the people that are near us. And in that regard, I am totally jazzed about the opportunity to do something along those lines by the building of a new program of Genomics Centers of Excellence in Africa. This builds upon a program that NHGRI had a huge role in called H3 Africa, Human Health and Heredity in Africa, which over 10 years built capacity in DNA sequencing and analysis in multiple different institutions and in multiple countries in Sub-Saharan Africa in a way that most people really didn't expect was going to work, or certainly not as well as it did. And now the publications coming out of there, the, the, the degree of excellent science that's happening is truly impressive. But that program is about at the end of its 10-year cycle, and something needs to step in to take it to the next level. And I do believe this notion of centers of excellence, which is now getting a lot of attention, I'll be talking to people in the West Wing about it tomorrow, uh, is maybe a way uh, to build on that capacity and really make it possible in places that could benefit hugely from expanding uh, their abilities in this space uh, to have the resources and the chance to train their next workforce to do so. The kinds of things the centers of excellence might do would be to incorporate some of the things that we are learning how to do here, starting from the left, newborn screening, certainly pathogen sequencing. This is one of the reasons I think this is going to be a particularly compelling case right now, because if you need to be doing surveillance of the next pathogen that's emerging, or maybe just of COVID-19 because it's still there, you need the kind of sequencing capacity, which, by the way, H3 Africa helped happen. And the fact that we knew what was going on in South Africa and Nigeria and a few other African countries was not just good luck. It was those investments, and we're going to need them more than ever. Um, things like the APOL1 story, which is a remarkable one where it's sort of like sickle cell, a variant has been selected for because it provides uh, basically uh, protection against the most severe form of trypanosomiasis. This is very much, therefore, something that's relevant uh, to people from West Africa. If we want to understand that and figure out how best to treat it, this is where we should be. Um, there's HIV AIDS still waiting for a cure. We have a treatment. PEPFAR made that possible, but those people have to take drugs for the rest of their lives. 
That's very expensive, and it's not without side effects. Could we come up with a way, maybe using CRISPR, to go and find those lurking proviruses that are hiding somewhere in a reservoir in the body of somebody who's HIV positive and knock them out? And then you wouldn't have to take the drugs anymore. There are people thinking that could work. Another great opportunity uh, for a genomics approach. And I've mentioned the cure for sickle cell disease, and we should not be satisfied unless it's one that will work where most of the people are who have it. Cardiovascular disease. You know, people think, oh, the diseases in Africa are infectious, and there's plenty of that, but the fastest growing area of morbidity and mortality in Africa are Western illnesses like diabetes, like heart disease, hypertension, and stroke. And those genetic risks are maybe a little different if we actually did the work of going to look for them. Pharmacogenomics, likewise, if you want to optimize the therapeutics for a particular condition, then you probably need to know that individual's ability to handle that particular therapy. And then oncology. Most uh, African populations don't have access to what I just described a minute ago as increasingly the standard of care for the U.S. That's not right. And with the kind of capacity that we could build with these centers, maybe it could start to happen. So I'm hopeful with uh, the kind of motivations uh, that uh, apply to this by a lot of people, we might see this as the next step in taking genomics to a place where basically you could say it all started, the cradle of humanity, where we all come from. We are all Africans. Finally, none of this is going to happen in the U.S. <laughs> in Africa or anywhere else if we don't have the people uh, to make it happen. And that means this sort of future requires a vibrant and diverse genomics workforce. I'm really glad that today's presentations have talked about that a lot. And I'm hoping that there are people who've been listening in the uh, various uh, times I've looked at, at the roster of who's online, hundreds of people. And I hope there's a lot of young people there that are wondering about their own possible contributions here. This is the most exciting time you can imagine in biomedical research, and probably more so in genomics than any other part, just because of the potential here. So if you are thinking about something that you might want to do that would both be intellectually inspiring and exciting and working with amazing people and also making a difference uh, to help humanity, this is the time, and this is the place uh, where you could put your efforts and really make that difference. So yeah, maybe that's you, that vibrant and diverse genomics workforce. Finish with a quote, which I haven't used in a long time. I used to use it in the 1990s when people were saying, you know, why are you doing the Genome Project? It seems like such a big, sprawling enterprise. You know, most things get done by people in laboratories late at night just having a eureka moment. And yes, an awful lot does happen there. But there are times, oh, sorry, I skipped that one and come to the, my quote here. This is Daniel Burnham, who's an architect who designed a lot of the buildings uh, in Washington, D.C. And it doesn't apply to everything, but it sure works for the Genome Project. Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. Remembering that a noble logical diagram once recorded, does that sound like the genome? Will never die, but long after we are gone, will be a living thing asserting itself with ever-growing insistency. That assertion is going on right now, right here today, and will go on even more in the years to come. Thank you all. Questions and then okay, so uh, questions from the audience and questions from the web. Roseanne, there's a oh. and I don't see microphones on either. I had that maybe. Well, where are the microphones going? I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's there. It's there. It's just the light. Oh, I can't see it. I see. It. I'm sorry. My fault. That was wonderful, Francis. Uh, although I don't understand. Early on, you said something about putting the marshmallow peep in the in your shelf until it dried out. You don't know about that. Well, don't don't they don't get eaten right away? No, household? they get better after they get really oh. stale and dried out. Okay, <laughs> you heard it here. Okay, <laughs> Francis, what surprised you the most in the last twenty years? 
since the end of the Genome Project. You, you gave us several highlights. I just want to know what is singularly the most surprising thing that you would have never have anticipated the day you declared the Genome Project uh, over. I got to give you two. Okay. Uh, one was stem cells, that you can take a blood cell or a skin cell and add four carefully chosen genes <laughs> that Shinya Yamanaka figured out, and that becomes a pluripotent stem cell that you can turn into almost anything. That was so unanticipated. When I read that paper, I got chills. That was 2006, 2007. And of course, the other one, which I'm sure you're expecting, but you should, is CRISPR. The ability to do this kind of gene editing, almost like your word processor, where you get to do search and replace just with the appropriate apparatus. With all that that's meant already in every laboratory, but what it's starting to mean in medical application, hard to say uh, too much about that. And yeah. Thank you to our uh, Nobel Prize winners, uh, Doudner and Charpentier, for taking what seemed like a very obscure area of basic science and just blowing everything up. So my question is, what, the DNA, DNA has double helix strands, so why did it evolve like that? <laughs> that is a big question that nobody knows yet. Nobody and, knows that. Why does it do that double helix thing? I know it's like in its structure, mm -hmm. but like why? Like what kind of sequence or thing made it do that? I know it's a back, I know ribo deoxyribose is a never would see D DNA. So why is deoxyribose like that? That's, it's. Yeah. You know, we can't, uh, unless we get a time machine, uh, go back and see. There are people who think maybe it started first as RNA, a single-stranded molecule like this, and DNA came along later. But think about it. We can sort of have the thought experiment. If you didn't know the answer <laughs> and you had to come up with a way of designing an information molecule that could live inside each cell, and every time the cell divides, you have to get a copy of it, that's one of the most amazing things about the double helix. You sort of unravel it, and each copy, each strand uses itself as a template for the next one. Um, you want it to be in a place where it's pretty stable, so you don't want it just flopping all around. That double helix is kind of nice <laughs> there in terms of its structure. Um, I have a hard time um, thinking of other alternatives, but of course, we got what we got. Maybe if we find life on some other planet, we'll see what they used. So we had a career panel recently, earlier today, and I think one of the things that came up was sort of the role of teamwork in genomics. And I just wanted to think, as you, you know, you touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but li laying into that a little bit more, how do you view that both sort of in a smaller team and when you think about the sort of international field, sort of advice to people considering starting off in genomics? I think for all of science, but maybe particularly for genomics, uh, the team part of it has both been part of the reason it's been successful and part of the reason it's been fun. <laughs> and that, again, turning the clock back uh, when most of you in this room were not doing science or maybe weren't born, that was not the norm at all. Uh, if you go back 60 years ago, most researchers uh, were pretty much doing their own thing with a small group in their own lab. The potential of going faster gets so much better uh, when you have the chance to put together a team of people with different skills and different capabilities. And I learned that with that search for cystic fibrosis. I was just a lab trying to go after that, and it wasn't going so well, and ultimately merging with another lab in Toronto and basically turning us into one single lab made all the difference. And the Genome Project has certainly been a great example of how that can work. It takes special efforts on a team to be sure everybody's contributions are being recognized. You can't take that for granted. But the gratification you get about being able to do things so much faster makes it all worth it. So I would say uh, if you go to my lab right now, you'll see pretty much everything we're working on is in a team kind of effort with pretty wide open sharing of information. And I just think that is so much more gratifying in terms of what you want to do scientifically, and also those relationships. They become your friends. Uh, they become the people that you want to talk about other things besides science. Uh, 
And that's uh, a good thing. We don't have to be all introverts, even though I'm traditionally called by my wife as being one. I actually do enjoy very much the chance to work with other people, and you will too. Yes? Question. Oh, sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Question. We have an online question. As the amount of data increases almost exponentially, how do you see the future of analyzing this increasingly highly dimensional genomic, multi-omic data proceeding? A great question. And if we didn't have other ways of being helped and we just had to stare at the data, we'd be in such trouble. But this is why the whole area of computational biology has become so central to almost everything we do. Uh, my lab used to be mostly people working at the bench and now it's maybe a third at the bench and two thirds on the computer. And the ability, because of so many of these data sets are public, to be able to do things um, uh, without necessarily having to have put in uh, years of work yourself on generating the data set. It's just there waiting to have insights provided. That means, by the way, you know, for people who are getting into biomedical science, uh, it would be a really good thing to learn how to code, <laughs> because more and more uh, the kinds of questions you want to ask will be assisted by that, and it'll be even better if you can write it yourself, uh, the code, instead of trying to get somebody else's buggy program to run. Uh, but I don't, I'm not too worried. Uh, I'm excited. And of course, artificial intelligence, machine learning find their way in here in really interesting ways. I think the biggest promise of AI right now is in life science. Uh, it's been more highlighted in other places, like you know, self-driving cars. But the real opportunities that are going to give knowledge and insight and Human benefit, I think, are probably going to be in life science for the most part. Yes. Can we have a mic on? Hello. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Collins, for this amazing presentation. I had a quick question. So out of the many, many genomes that are, or sequences that are in humans, which specific section of the sequence is essential for genomic function? Thank you. <laughs> Which is essential for genomic function? You know, there were some careless statements made uh, back when we were sequencing the genome that the only part that mattered was the part that codes for protein. Uh, that couldn't be right. I hope I never said that. The idea that the rest was junk, uh, that, that, was, that would have been terribly naive. There are parts of the genome that probably are not too important um, in terms of those repeats uh, that are present in hundreds of thousands of copies where it probably doesn't matter for most of those uh, whether it's uh, necessarily there, although some of them turn out to be important. But I think we have huge respect now <laughs> for the 98% of the genome that doesn't code for protein because that's where all the fascinating stuff is, all the regulatory signals that allow a liver cell to do what a liver cell needs to do and a brain cell to do something very different even though they're working with the same instruction book. So. All of that regulatory information, that is so profoundly in the middle of what everybody's trying to sort out. And we're making real progress. And of course, in there is all the mysteries that we want to solve about how you go from being a single cell, which you all once were, to now being a really complicated organism. That all has to be something whoops, encoded, sorry about that, in, in that non-coding part of the DNA to turn the genes on or off at the right time. So yeah, that's going to be keeping us busy for a while. Maybe one more question. All righty. Hello. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's very exciting to see what you identified as the exciting frontiers in genomics going forward. And I know our institute has more and more exciting collaborations with other institutes and other fields. So my question is, uh, what interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborations are you most excited about going forward in the field? So as I said, I think collaborations are the way to go. And that's not just between individual labs, that's also between institutions. So I'm glad you asked the question in that way. The Genome Institute is ideally suited <laughs> to be the catalyst uh, of many of those kinds of efforts. And I can point to examples. Look at the Undiagnosed uh, Diseases Program, which started sort of from this idea about how do we figure out rare diseases by bringing a lot of smart people together, getting the genome sequenced. And it's now become, a, I did it again, now become a national network that has answered uh, really incredibly challenging mysteries uh, for hundreds and hundreds of people. And I think Eric would also point uh, to other places. The All of Us program, 
which is intended to be about all diseases, but genomics is going to be particularly important uh, to try to make sure we're thinking through what the most exciting opportunities might be. And all of the ways in which uh, the Genome Project has also worked, uh, I would say, with cancer. We would not see the progress that I was talking about with cancer genomics if it hadn't been for that kind of close collaborative effort. And there are people in this room that had a lot to do with making that happen. I could go on and on, but I think of all the institutes, all 27 of them across uh, the NIH, probably they're a pretty short list where collaborations are the way they make success. NHGRI, NCATS, uh, certainly in that space, um, um, NIGMS, yes, also, um, and a few others. But this is kind of the DNA, if you don't mind my saying so, of the Genome Institute is collaboration. Well, I gather there's a guitar over there. And people are wondering, is that just a, uh, a set piece? Well, well yes. Um, I am prone at times like this to think that there ought to be music, and especially if it's possible, participatory music. The doors are now locked, so you can't run away. Oh, that sounds pretty hot. Um, and, you know, just because it is an anniversary, you see that picture I showed of the National Building Museum? That was 2001, and we had a band, and a lot of people gathered around, including my mom. And um, one of the songs we did in 2001 was one that I co-wrote with John O'Shea, who's currently the scientific director of NIEMS, and is a really good musician. And of course, we didn't write the song, we wrote the words, because that's what I usually try to do, is take a song that you've heard before and then teach you a new version to it so that you'll always be haunted by that. <laughs> and um, before I get to the song, I do need to introduce the guitar because every guitar has to have a name, and after my comments at the beginning of the presentation, I really have to tell you the name of this guitar. It is not Watson, even though there's a double helix on the fretboard. It is not Crick. This is Rosalind, and she's here for you. And this has a little bit of a echo. You probably, if you're mm, about as old as me, you'll know this song. And if you're quite a bit younger, you may have heard it, uh, either from Smokey Robinson or maybe from the Beatles. But yeah, there's an echo. And when I get to that, I'm going to point to you, and you'll sort of know you're supposed to do it. And we'll see if that is good enough. Otherwise, I might actually teach it a little better. But this is a song that used to be, you really got a hold on me. But this is about DNA. We really got the code on you. Well, Mendel had all his a wrinkled peas, and Darwin had all his finches beaks. But oh, 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 we really got you now. You can't stop us now. Really got the code on you, really got the code on, we really got the code on, really got the code on you, baby. Watson and Crick, they were the first to see that A matches T and G pairs with C, but oh, 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 we really got you now, you can't stop us now, we really got the code on you, we really got the code on is just read you, read you, read you, and compute on you. Well, they didn't know you, but now we know you. Just want to know you, don't want to own you. That was for Elsie. Oh, 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 we really got you now. You can't stop us now. We really got the code on you. And we really got the code on you. Baby, sequencing the genome is medicine's foundation. It's been 20 years, so let's have a celebration. Oh, 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 we really got you now. 
you can't stop us now. We really got the code on you. We really got the code on you. Baby, genome, you rule. You're so very cool. So let's read you. Read you. Read you. We need you. Happy DNA Day! <laughs> everyone who is in the auditorium, who stayed, and everyone online, went, there was a couple other questions that came in, why Francis was talking specifically. When can I get this talk on video? Uh, and so uh, just for those of you that are interested in reliving the experience or passing it on, uh, we have a YouTube channel called Genome TV, which you can subscribe to, and you'll get a note when these are posted. If you don't want to subscribe, the videos of all of today should be posted in about a week. Looking at the crew up there, they have to clean them up and make them into separate categories. So in about a week or so, you can pass this information on to others as well as relive. Um, you can't record that, and then sell it, because that would be against copyright laws. Although it's public, you're a public servant, so it's public domain. <laughs> so I just want to close by thanking, um, there's a lot of people behind the scenes who pulled today together, uh, one of whom you've seen in front of the scenes, Ernesto, I'm pointing to him while he's taking pictures. Who, uh, in addition to documenting uh, in still photography the day, he's also done a bunch of the artwork. Um, the team also included Brittany Kish, who, somewhere back there. Daryl Legia, who did more additional artwork. He's over there. Jenny Montooth, who you saw uh, in several costume changes um, today. Uh, Marisa Pittman, who is still in the back. Um, Gerald Samani in the back as well, making things run smoothly. And um, lastly, and, and these were in alphabetical order, so this is Roseanne Wise over there, from, uh, who also was on the committee. So, oh, and Alvaro, sorry. Alvaro is the person who will make those videos happen. Um, so. Sarah, Sarah too? Oh, and Sarah Bates too. <laughs> she wasn't on the list. But, uh, and with that, we bring the DNA day to a close. We can calculate the next convergence of uh, 30 years and 80 years. And uh, I don't know what 70 was platinum. I'm not sure what 80 years will be. Right. <laughs> so um, next year, we'll have a smaller program. Uh, if you're interested, Google DNA day around this time, and we will have a lecture. Um, it'll be the 21st and the 71st. Um, anniversaries. Um, so thank you for your attention and uh, it's been great having everyone.